Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, today I'd like to address something that's making the rounds through the Flat Earth community right now. And that is, can we use the apparent horizon to find a geometric radius? So, let's go look at the controversy and see where their errors and reasoning are. So, let's cue up the music and get going. Hey, before we get going with today's video, I want to thank the person that bought one of my coffee cups. I kind of toyed with the idea of having an online store and I designed one piece of merchandise, this coffee cup. You know, it's a pretty cool coffee cup. It's got me on one side and it's got the symbol I used to use for the channel on the other. And one person actually bought it. I hadn't even promoted it yet. So if you guys would like to have a look, go to my channel, have a look at the store and see what you think. Now, just to quickly go over the method Al Biruni, you're looking at an observation of the apparent horizon from a known elevation. Now, I've done several videos on this, and if you really want to know the method Al Biruni in detail, including the mathematics, I'll refer you to those videos. Now, there are two parts to the method Al Biruni. The first part is to find the height of your observation point. The second part is to look at the drop to the horizon from your observation point. Using trigonometric functions, you can then determine the radius of the Earth. Now, the methods are pretty straightforward if you know a little trigonometry and algebra. And if you don't, I walk you through them on a couple of my videos. And in case you're curious, this is Fort Nandana in western Pakistan. This is the precipice from which Al Biruni made his measurements. So he had a very nice view of a long, flat valley in front of him. And it was very easy to determine the drop to the horizon using an astrolabe. Now, the drawback of the method Al Biruni is that he did not take into account atmospheric refraction or the difference between the apparent and the geometric horizon. Well, that begs the question, how much of a difference does it actually make? Now, this is the data from the main surveyor who's featured in one of those videos. He made his measurements from a height of 77.4 feet above sea level. And as you can see, he came within 5% of the actual radius of the Earth even from 77 feet. Now, another measurement was taken by Wolfie 6020 flying an aircraft at 45,000 feet, measuring a dip to the horizon of 3.75 degrees compared to less than one-sixth of a degree for the main surveyor. His accuracy, he came up with a radius of the Earth of 3,972 miles. The actual radius of the Earth is 3,958 miles, and that's an error of less than 0.3%. Now, one of the problems that you run into with the method Al Biruni is that you've got to have an elevated observation. You cannot make this observation from sea level. Now, for example, the black swan was taken from an elevation of three feet. Now, while the drop to the horizon was not given, and despite being asked, they will not give the drop to the horizon, probably because they didn't bother measuring one, that drop will be close to zero degrees. Now, if you look at the formula, it's height of the observation times the cosine of alpha, which is the dip, over one minus the cosine of alpha. The cosine of zero degrees, which is what you would get, or very nearly, from an elevation of three feet, is close to one. Now, when you have no drop to the horizon because you're measuring from just above the water, this term reverts to h over zero, which is undefined. It simply can't be used from sea level. You have to get up at some height. And that's why when flat earthers try and point to the Alberuni equation, they always use sea level observations because they know that it can't be done from sea level. Now let's go ahead and have a look at an example of this. Now here we have prominent flat earther and father of the year, Nathan Oakley. Let's let him go through this with rumpus. He's not gonna get within 5% of it because we can't see it. I'm not scared. I'm destroying a globe, Faith, you hold. One, two, three. Testing one, two, three. All like a Sorry, words, let's just establish with rumpus okay, on, on question, mute Nathan. if he's Testing not listening one, to me again, two, same as yesterday. Anybody in Discord? You talk so, through the entire so thing. like the last time we got to this concluding point, he called me scaredy cat, scaredy cat. And on this occasion, I've said I'm not scared to discuss the fact that you cannot derive geometry from a horizon he defines as not geometric. That would be apparent. 
You can't derive geometry, as is claimed Al Biruni did, from something he can't see. Now, according to Rumpus and every fundy on this circuit, we cannot see a geometric horizon. We are not going to see the geometric horizon. No one's claiming that we see physical geometry. It's not a visual horizon. Of course, what Mr. Oakley will say is that we presuppose what the Earth is, the shape of the Earth. Well, yes. Well, I feel a little left out. Let's add my two cents to that as well. We see the apparent horizon, not the geometric horizon, and it simply doesn't matter. When you do the method Al Biruni properly, there's very little difference between the location of the geometric and the apparent horizon. And the error that it gives in the radius of the Earth is at most a percent or two. Now, even a low observation like the main surveyor from only 70 feet was less than a 5% error. Al Biruni got it within 1% to 2% from his mountain fort, and Wolfie 6020 got it within one-third of a percent from 45,000 feet. So why is this argument completely irrelevant? The argument is irrelevant because the method Al Biruni is not the only way we find the radius of the Earth. We can find it by the method Eratosthenes, where we look at the shadows cast by the sun, and that doesn't involve refraction at all because the sun is near the zenith. We can also measure the distance over the ground of a great circle course between two cities on Earth, say New York and Cologne. Now, the distance between those two cities is a great circle course. If you back calculate that, it will give you the radius of the Earth. Now, when the radius of the Earth from Al Biruni, from Eratosthenes, and from great circles and for that matter, from the curve calculator, all are in agreement with each other. That's very strong evidence that that's the correct radius of the Earth. So let's go on to see how Nathan Oakley tries to put a spin on this to make it fit his flat Earth narrative. No, okay, I don't mind summarizing that point. Al Biruni's supposed to be measuring geometry, and according to you, he's measuring an apparent horizon that isn't geometric. So he's not measuring geometry. Oh, I'm not scared of it. That was the point we ended on last well, time when you said scaredy cat, scaredy cat through me about a hundred times. Scared. Now you're talking through me. It seems you're yeah, talking through me. It seems that Rumpus is a scaredy cat because he definitely doesn't want to listen to and then respond to the fact that he said Al Biruni's measuring an apparent horizon, which he made very clear isn't geometric. Therefore, Al Biruni's definitely not going to derive geometry from that. He's going to talk through me, scaredy cat, like? scaredy cat. Scaredy cat, scared to listen I to my rebuttal, same as last time, scaredy like. cat, scaredy cat. Well, I think we're off to a very childish start on the part of Nathan Oakley calling Rumpus scaredy cat. This is the thing that they like to make hay on. You can't get a geometric radius from an apparent horizon. Well, you certainly can't. You're going to get a slight error somewhere on the order of less than 5%, less than 2%, or less than 1%, depending on your observer elevation. But it's going to be very close, and it will be confirmed by measuring the radius by other methods as well, coming up with the same radius. If you have three or four different methods to calculate the radius of the Earth, and they all give you an answer that is within a percent or two of each other, chances are that's a pretty good reading. So let's go back and listen to our favorite two Flat Earth scholars, Nathan Oakley and Anthony Riley. You word, can't Al. respond to this. Not a word. I can't speak at all. Oh, God, I'm going to get a chance. No, I'm going to repeat my statement and then you can respond to it. Or you can say scaredy cat. Those are your two options. Either you respond to me with a rebuttal or you talk through me. I don't mind which. So you've expressly detailed that the geometric horizon is not the apparent horizon. And the only thing that you can derive geometry from would be the geometric horizon. You told us Al Biruni's measuring the apparent horizon, so he cannot derive geometry from it. He can because they're very close together. If you go They're very close, so they're not the same. But Nathan, are they close enough? This raises the question is, what's good enough? Now, do you need an exact number? No. One of the things that we do when we do Earth science is we're constantly refining our measurements, getting closer and closer and closer to the truth. So if we're a percent or two off, that's still a pretty good answer. It's also quite usable. Now, here's the bottom line, Nathan, and I don't think anybody's clued you into this yet. If the radius of the Earth 
as measured by Al Biruni, is as much as 10% off. And that's really a stretch. That still means the Earth is spherical. A flat Earth does not have a radius. And we've got four different ways of determining that the Earth has got a radius, and they're all within a couple of percentages of each other. So, what is your point? So it's not giving him geometry. It's close enough. Close enough? It's just good enough, Globe Fundies. You heard it here first. He's not measuring geometry. Apparently he's getting R from this measurement, but it's good enough. For him, yeah. For him, it's good enough. Well, yeah, it is good enough. It's clearly good enough. If you understand the limitations of the method, and that is that the lower you are to the surface, the less accurate it is. The higher your observation point above the surface, the more accurate it is. Now, given the equipment that Al Biruni had in the 11th century AD, he did a pretty doggone good job. A very good job, in fact. Getting within 2% of the actual radius of the Earth is pretty doggone good. Just a casual observation from an airplane at 45,000 feet using the method Al Biruni will get you within 0.3% of the radius of the Earth. That's fine with me. Yeah, just good enough to base an R value that you then use to bend the horizon into a different position. Good enough to base the refraction value of R on. Now watch Nathan try and tie the Al Biruni calculation of the R value to atmospheric refraction. Because as you know, atmospheric refraction is 7 over 6R. Well, Nathan, what exactly does 7 over 6R mean? Does that mean that your horizon is extended by 1 sixth? Does that mean the curve of the refraction has got a radius that is related to 7 over 6 times the radius of the Earth? Can you tell me why we can't use my determination of R? And that is 1.22 times the great circle distance over the ground between New York City and Cologne? Not only will that work out right, you can make predictions with it. So can you make predictions with anything on the flat Earth? Anything at all? We don't use Al Bruni's value now, Nathan. We've got. Sorry, you use an R value, and he was deriving it. Yeah, but we don't use the way. He... Sorry, you use an R value, and that's what he was supposed to be measuring. Now you see how Nathan is trying to tie the entire refraction, shape of the Earth, size of the Earth, to one measurement by an Islamic scholar in the 11th century, as if we have never measured it in any other time or by any other means. So by arguing against Al Biruni, he's trying to prove that the globe doesn't exist. It's a knight's errand, but it is rather comical. So let's go on. Am I scared? I don't seem very scared. You are. You, you... Oh, really? I seem terrified while I point out that he couldn't have derived geometry because he couldn't see a geometric horizon. You've told us. Everything I say. Then how, how right. did he know so he was close enough? That he got he couldn't, see, couldn't he even see the geometric horizon. I could never get in at all. Uh, who cares? You've told us he measured the apparent horizon. And the only thing that's going to give him geometry is a geometric horizon, which he wasn't measuring according to you. They're very much not the same thing. You're being pummeled. You know, we give a crap about your bleatings. Possibly no, we don't. Forwards. My and we don't care about your bleatings. How many words you get here is not of concern to me. What is of concern to me is that you've pointed out that Al Biruni's measuring an apparent horizon, so he's not got a geometric value from that then. Now let's just think about this for a second. Now, an American basketball is about that big. Okay? We play, we play a game with it. Try and throw it through a hoop. Now, you can look at that basketball and kind of judge about how big it is. But if you want to actually know the measurement on the size and the inflation of that basketball, that individual basketball, you need to measure it. And your measurements are only as good as the tools that you use to measure. So, for example, you can squeeze it a little bit and try and judge how much air pressure is in the basketball, or you can directly measure the air pressure in the basketball. You can wrap a string around it and then try and eyeball how long the string is, or you can actually wrap a tape measure around it and physically measure how, how big it is. 
or you can wrap a tailor's tape around it and actually measure the circumference of that basketball. These are all ways to refine the measurement of that basketball. It doesn't change the fact the basketball is spherical and about that big. The only thing that we're changing is the accuracy of the measurements, and Al Biruni did a fine job in the 11th century. Wolfie 6020 did a fine job just simply measuring the drop to the horizon in the 21st century. The mathematics is correct. It's a matter of measuring the angle. What is the angle on this black swan with all that distortion, Nathan? Can you tell us? Did you even bother measuring it? But I bet you're going to use the method Al Biruni to try and claim the radius of the Earth based on this photograph is something outrageous. Yet you won't show your math. So no, not even one word. Yeah, that's all you can do. It's bleeped about how many words you get. You can't respond, can you, scaredy cat? I'm pointing out that that apparent horizon's not geometric, and you're scared. Three words. Yeah, you're scared, scaredy cat. Scaredy cat hasn't got a geometric horizon. Word now. I'm down to zero words. Oh. No, we're hearing you saying how many words you get each time. We're hearing you not respond to me pointing out that he's not deriving geometry from an apparent horizon. Well, actually, he did respond. He said it was close enough, and it is indeed close enough. It's within 2%. Or, if you get higher, within less than 1%. That's fine. That's something, for example, that we can use in navigation on our spherical Earth. Can you give me a tool that you can use for navigation on a flat Earth? Do you have an actual model of a flat Earth? Can you draw me a flat Earth map? So basically, Nathan, no matter how much you try and talk over rumpus, no matter how childish you get in these debates, your entire point that the Earth is flat is moot. The best that you can do is say the radius is not exactly what we come up with when we do our measurements. It could be a little off. Even if it was as much as 10% off, it's still a spherical Earth. So what's your point? You don't really have one. And the sad thing about it is you don't realize that. So this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by and visiting with me. Stop by and buy a coffee cup from me. I'd like to see some more of those out there. Send me a picture of you drinking some coffee with your coffee cup. In the meantime, happy Father's Day to all you fathers and stepfathers out there. It's a little belated, but hey, it's Monday. I'll see you guys again soon. Take care.